Hey, welcome everybody. I'm Love Coach Scott Thomas, and it is time for Straight Talk. And no, it has nothing to do with being heterosexual. We are open and we welcome everybody of all faiths, religions, genders, transgenders, sexual orientations. Thank you, Scott. <laughs> that was for you, Trish. I know. <laughs> and there she is. There's my wonderful co-host, the lovely Trish Wright. Thank you for the, the invitation for the not so straight straight talk. Yeah, exactly. um, I don't know if you all caught it, but the inside, the background thing is that I'm like, hey, Scott, some of us aren't exactly, <laughs> we're a little bit more. <laughs> anyway, we have an amazing guest on tonight and I'm really excited to hear what he has to say. Yeah. So Scott, take it away. Yeah, so um, Gary Malkin is our guest. And I've known Gary for years, and he is extraordinary. Um, and I'm so grateful that he agreed to spend time with us tonight. I'm going to put the spotlight on Gary, and I'm going to tell you a little bit about him. Um, he is an Emmy Award winning, multiple Emmy Award winning composer, public speaker, educator, and as it relates to tonight, a music and health innovator. We're going to learn tonight all about how Gary champions the music the power of music to promote health, wellness, and compassion. Um, he's redefining the role of music in life's challenging transitions on both individual and institutional levels. Gary has focused on developing music and related resources that serve four goals, easing the dying process, enhancing bonding with newborns, alleviating stress for healthcare providers, and deepening heart-centered mindfulness. So that's what we're gonna be talking about. But I do wanna let you know that he's best known for the acclaimed classic, Great Graceful Passages and Companion for Living and Dying. It was co-created uh, between Gary and Michael and Doris Stillwater. And it's considered to be the finest work of its kind. It has touched nearly a million people, offering support during the very many phases of loss of all kinds. Uh, so Gary, uh, of course, I've had you on Saturday Night Live. You're an amazing musician. You've got one of the biggest hearts on the planet. Gary's like this big heart with little legs. <laughs> I want stronger legs, actually. I'm trying to lose some weight more. I just lost 18 pounds. I'm looking for 30 more to be released, but right, strong Congrats. legs. Looking quite, quite strong, my friend. <laughs> so Thanks. Tell us initially just a little bit about the history of how you went from this amazing musician into the the health and wellness and and specifically the dying field. Yeah, yeah. Well, first of all, both of you, Trish and Scott, thank you so much for having me on. This is this is talking about one of my favorite subjects because ironically, people think, well, why would you want to focus on grief, right? Well, it's the one that leads to the most gratitude and joy when you fully embrace the reality of our impermanence. It's way selfish because you end up realizing how precious this moment is. It's, so the, the history is that um, I always loved music as a way to unify and open people's hearts, right? So even when I was a child and playing the piano, I noticed that when people were fighting, I'd go to the piano and the family and things would chill, you know? <laughs> and it's probably a little bit scary to have that kind of power as a six-year-old, but, <laughs> but suddenly I'd play and I was self-soothing, but also I noticed on some subliminal level there was some soothing going on in my dysfunctional Jewish family from New York, right? But specifically, after a 20-year, very active career as a t uh, composer of film, TV, commercials, video games, you know, I had the largest music production company in the Bay Area from roughly 1981 to 98, around that. And um, what I loved the most was doing music for uh, socially responsible causes. And I noticed that every time I did a pro bono, whether it was just music for AIDS or saving, you know, raising money for cancer or dealing with the environment. I, I'd always feel like I didn't do it for money. I always felt like, God, how can I do this like every day? This is how I want to feel. I want to like make a difference and bring the world to make it a better place. And then sure enough, you know, the harder they fall, I had a huge accident, a bicycle accident in 1998 with my daughter. And that was the summer 
where everything other than losing my daughter, I, I everything shattered. And you know, you know, it's like nothing like tragedy to wake you up. And, uh, and they didn't know if I'd ever play the piano again. Um, and I had three ribs cracked and 18 fractures and 50 stitches. I was like, that was a mess. And um, my wife left the marriage a month later. I mean, like my 5,000 square foot home was living alone. It's just, it was an insane experience. And it was, there was no question about it. It was a death, uh, aside from dying. It was a true death in every way. And about a year later, when I was finally able to play again, during that year was when Michael came to me and asked me if I would, Michael Stillwater came to me and asked me if he were helping people dying, he would love my music to be a part of it, which was a lovely thing for him to say. And I'll, I'll let that pause because that's a whole other story. But once we experienced creating something that made a measurable difference in people's lives. When we saw that what we had started to create it turned out to be this spoken word and music experience that um, where we interviewed the words of um, the early speakers was, I think, Arun and Sananda Gandhi, the grandson of Mahatma Gandhi and uh, someone else. But once we saw that we could create something that would crack people's hearts open and create a cathartic experience that changed the course of their whole way in which they're regarding the loss, literal or metaphoric. Once I got a taste of that, <laughs> I mean, what could compete with making a difference in someone's life like that? I, I was a revelation. And of course, simultaneously, I was using the project to heal the broken heart of my marriage ending and my body and everything. So I went through the three years of writing Graceful Passages where if all I ever thought was if there was one person that would benefit from this and it was me, that it would be enough, you know? And that's why, why Graceful, I think, I believe it has touched so many people. It was the tool through which I came to fully recognize that we are gonna, each of us gonna disappear one day and none of us ever knows when it's gonna happen or how. And, and this is the last thing I'll end with is just a perfect way to open which is 5,000 years ago, the Bhagavad Gita said, what, what is the most remarkable thing in all the world? And paraphrased, the Bhagavad Gita said, the most remarkable thing is that all of us will die, but no one ever thinks it'll happen to them. <laughs> <laughs> and when I suddenly realized this was a perennial human condition and that music might have a role, in more than entertainment, what I would call, as, but entertainment, but but literally medicine that just doesn't relax us, but disarms us and cracks us open like Leonard Cohen, ring the bells that sting, you know, they're ringing the bells that still can ring. There is a crack in everything there. there you know, that's how the light gets in. Right. That's what happened to me. I, my, my heart cracked open and I decided that my role was to use music as a Trojan horse to wake people up from the inside out. Wow. Um, That's a long answer. Sorry. It was no, pretty. Oh, no. Listen, tonight's Gary Malkin night. Okay. I won't say sorry ever again. Yeah, no, sorry. Um, uh, just we, we want to hear all about it. Great. You know, stories are always so powerful, and you're a beautiful storyteller. You've also scored, you know, so you understand the power of the story. Do you have like a particular one specific story you'd love to share of how your music or maybe what you created with the Stillwaters impacted a life or lives? Oh, oh with the Stillwaters. Okay, well, I wrote all that music, but in one of the great acts of surrender, Michael thought it was going to be all his songs. And we organically came up with this idea because you've probably been at Michael's events. He is a very prayerful, multi-denominational, uh, revolutionary minister in his own way, right? And so he said, Michael, go in the studio and imagine talking to somebody who just received a terminal diagnosis. And then, you know, I would go on the keyboard and orchestrally score spontaneously as if it were a film score, this heartwarming thing. And that's when we looked at each other and we went, has anyone ever done that before? Like use the art of film scoring to unlock the capacity for us to be on the edge of our seats, feeling the emotional and spiritual intent of a wisdom keeper? <laughs> well, nobody's ever done it because who would ever make money from it, right? <laughs> but, we, but we did that. And 
I remember when it was done with just one improvisation, we had chills, both of us, and we realized, holy shit. And that's when we started recording people. So there is, I thought you were going to ask me about a story that impacted me when I decided I had to like write music for, for film and stuff. And there was a equally powerful story there that just, I don't have to go there, but just want to reference it, that it was early in my career, I saw my music uplift people's hope in an anti-nuclear film. And I was in the back of Alice Tully Hall, the opening of New York, of the New York Film Festival. And I almost literally saw like the equivalent of the angel of death lifting and people breathing more deeply, all because of the oboe, that part that with the orchestra that I'd written at 30 years old. And, and that moment was like, holy, this is so much more than writing music. This is about impacting the emotional and spiritual field in a way that impacts people's lives and makes a difference in their the way they perceive things. It was like, what could be more exciting and per, and, and powerful, right? But but the answer about the there is one story. To this day, I get a little teary about it because I I it was, graceful passages had been out about a, a year. We were getting thousands of calls, grassroots people passing this thing on, growing grassroots like crazy. And this one call I got from a friend of mine from New York who had a family that were wealthy and there were four boys in the family and they were all feuding about money. And so the mother came down with a terminal illness and the fight was so severe that not one of the brothers would be in the hospital room with the father and the mother without with the other. They had to like go through all that effort because it was they hadn't talked in a number of years and it was just you know, it was completely intractable. And my friend gave a copy of Graceful and played a track for the youngest one that was his friend. And the young 25, 30 year old boy just started to sob, recognizing this was the moment that his mother was maybe had a week or two. And he called the one brother that had, a, he had a crack open of possible receptivity and said, look, all I wanna do is play you one thing for six minutes. And you can go right away. You don't have to talk to me. And he did it. And in the next 24 hours, each of the brothers played the opening track of Graceful Passages to eat to the one that they had an opening with. And within 24 hours to 36 hours, all the men, 24 to 30, 20, what is it? Like 30 to 45 or something, they all gathered. And for the next two weeks, they said goodbye to their mother properly. And I got the call from the father sobbing saying, do you have any idea what you have given to us? You know, you've given us our family back. And it was one of those moments where I just, there were, I have thousands of, we have thousands of those stories of people that allowed their fear, their denial, their avoidance, their discomfort, their shadowy, no, don't go, no, don't admit you're going, all that stuff that gets all murky. And the music just like literally like a knife, it just went, it just chilled everyone else into the innate knowing that we have when we're born, but it's another form of birth. It's a death, it's a birth death. It's a death birth. It's the cycle. It's the cycle of transition. So that's one of the stories that I am privileged to share. And I'm so grateful to be able to share it within this context, Scott. It's really the first time I've told the story in a long time. You know, we, we haven't prepared for this at all. For I know, I, know. I noticed. <laughs> I, I knew that there must be amazing stories, you know, and and I would love to hear more throughout the time that we're together tonight. You know, um, it reminded me of a story, actually. Um, and tonight you were focusing on grief and mourning, but I, I want to say that I think your music plays such an important role, Gary, because it music is the universal language. And music such as yours helps us to open our hearts and tap into a non-denominational spiritual experience. Exactly. Right. Or shall we say omni-denominational? <laughs> omni yeah, that's even better. Thank you. An omni-denominational spiritual experience. Absolutely. And it, in talking about grief, one of the things I made a note I really wanted to talk about is, and I'd love to hear what you and Trish have to say about this. Yeah, I'd love that. But a lot of people come to me because their husband's been diagnosed with terminal cancer or whatever it is. And I've 
I've worked with hundreds of people now that are dealing with really, really hard stuff. And I have to say, the ones that have a spiritual practice, it's so they're able to make their way through the challenge with much greater grace and ease. Right. And I'm certainly not promoting any specific spiritual practice. And a spiritual practice may or may not have anything to do with the religion. It right. Might, right. So it might be yoga. It might be nature. It might be playing a musical instrument, right? There's a lot of different forms of spiritual practice. Right. But I just really wanted to make that point. And I'm curious if you or Trish have any thoughts about the importance of spiritual practice to make our way through these challenging times. Trish? I have a, a couple thoughts, not specifically on that, but I can speak to that too. What I understand grief to be is love unexpressed. That's exactly right. The well of desire to, to express one's love, to, to feel the connection is, is the place where, you know, like, is that, that's the place where we're, we feel the emptiness of grief. And in our society, grief is actually, we don't honor it mm -hmm. in, in the way that a lot of other places do honor it, you know? Grief is a, a beautiful period of mourning. Um, so spiritual practice, I I'm often a little like, you know, wanting to not define spirituality as religion, but a, something like a connection to self or connection to the feeling of oneness as spiritualness or spirituality. And, and that's the exact thing that I got <laughs> from my friend who passed. Um, she had cancer. She, her friends invited me down and I got there the day that she, like, I got to hang out with her that day. And we laughed so hard. Um, I laid in bed with her for about six hours and we joked and she was really lucid. She was really there. Um, she was like, oh, this is annoying. Can't we get some hot young men to come in here and serve us? And I was like, oh yeah, hottie hospice lady. Like, you know, that's like the whole thing. We had this great time and she was so there. And when my, my partner at the time came in, um, later on, like she, she started to go really downhill very quickly in the day. And she, she was really scared. And she's like, you know, Trish, I'm really scared. And I, I said, you have permission to go if you want. We'll still love you. And we know that you love us. And my partner at that moment said to her something that really changed her life in the moment. And um, his teacher um, in the lineage of Ramahansa Yogananda said to him that cancer was the like in essence is burning off karma and she looked at him she goes oh, mm. Mm. And relaxed into that like knowing that she was doing her inner work mm -hmm. and i don't know i can't tell you what the i'm gonna use this word transmission exactly was it wasn't necessarily a verbal transmission that i got but it was something really special that I never looked at death the same again. And you know, what's really amazing that came into my life is that many people I know are death doulas. They sit with people who, who die and we talk about it. Like the way that my relationship to death and then my relationship to grief shifted in that moment that my friend was like, yes. And she, she died maybe like an hour or two later in the, her arms of her, her beloved mother. Hmm. But I had like, she, she downloaded something to me about contentment or safety. I don't, I just don't know, but it's a, it's a, it's like a feeling like a blanket. <laughs> Does this make sense? Mm -hmm. Definitely. What's that, what's that evoked for you, Gary? Does that uh, in, bring up a, a story or an experience to that? Well, you know, um, one of the things that, you know, living in this culture, 
we have to put on all kinds of armor or become like the culture by devaluing the importance of death, dying, illness as initiations, right? And so when when dying or, or serious illness or even confronting a life-threatening challenge comes up, um, this is, these are great uh, opportunities to be in awe of the great mystery, you know, and a lot of the times they say, you know, the Templeton Foundation talks about being in awe, being humble, being in gratefulness to the, the mystery is often a huge part of the initiatory journey of just of just finally recognizing that we have no <laughs> that we're not in control of this. Right. So that's one of the things that um, I want to actually play, if I could, either the video or the audio of, of one of the tracks from Graceful, because it would give us a chance to let the field be influenced in the way that we're talking about that could actually embody it. I don't, we don't have to play the whole thing. I can play part of it if you want. Yeah. So um, do you have it embedded in your computer? You I, I, yeah, I have it. I can play it as a part of my power, the PowerPoint that I have, which okay. I just have to share the, I just have to share the screen. You have screen sharing privileges. All right. Thank you. Great. Fantastic. Well, so this is this the idea of allowing ourselves to there are places where we you know we can never see ourselves right so there are places where we encounter places that we didn't know we didn't know that we were going to die and so or that we didn't know that we were carrying loss that we hadn't expressed or released so in order to get the full cleansing effect of what you're about to look at or listen to, let yourself just surrender to whatever experience your emotions are having. And for those of you who prefer not to look at anything, just to feel it all, then just listen. But here it is. It's called the opening track of Graceful. And it really is great to like, what if this were um, the eve of a, of a terminal diagnosis that you or someone you love received? And by the way, should I play the whole thing? It's about five and a half minutes can i do that or do you want me to fade it out in the middle somewhere i think five and a half minutes is great and i just invite everybody especially most people to watch this show watch the recording watch the replay so i recognize many of you might be multitasking and listening while you work turn off whatever else you're doing and let's really drop into this beautiful experience let's all have an experience together yeah good so this is lou epstein we asked him if you were going to die tomorrow, what would you say to the person you most love? Um, and here. It is. ever prepared us for this experience. We think it's the end. No. It's another beginning. Another beginning. to judge ourselves we're always judging ourselves but 
I learned to listen, that I was loved. I was loved. And then I would forget that I was loved. Those were the most painful times for me. Forgetting that I was loved. So you've let yourself be loved while you've been here. And you've judged yourself. And you've forgotten that you were loved. And you became alone. But you will always be here. You are blessed. You are forgiven. that you loved and you have to forgive all the time listen that you loved and forgive all the time you are Farewell, my son. Farewell, my daughter. Farewell, my father. Farewell, my mother. Farewell, my sister. Farewell, my brother. Thank you for letting me love you. Thank you for letting yourself be loved. God bless you. Just gorgeous. Hmm. Just gorgeous. It, it's it's really you know my favorite uh, patron saint or thought leader is John O'Donoghue, the mystic, the Irish mystic, and he has this book called Beauty: The Silent Embrace. And I, I, this is one of the reasons why I feel like you know my favorite composers, my favorite artists, but music was delivered for these times to. To thank with combined with Brene Brown's great work of recognizing that our vulnerability is the birthplace of our innocence and our authenticity, right? Well, so right on the eve of finding out that it takes bravery to be vulnerable, bravery to crack open, bravery to be human and wholehearted, we still live in a culture where it's it's harder than bravery even because it's so much ridicule and so much meanness and cruelty and divisiveness. And, you know, so to learn how to let music be these entrainment wheels into being comfortable with being tender with ourselves and each other. Tenderness is so closely associated with beauty. And when we get cracked open, it's not maudlin or cliched or sentimental, it's genuine moved, right? And that's what we, our objective was with Graceful Passages. 
How can we create a new innocence with our tenderness? What was your experience? Trish? Oh, um, I felt really like tight before. <laughs> mm, mm. Um, which is a very common experience for me, right, Scott? Uh -huh. <laughs> and I feel a lot more dropped in, connected, mm. present, mellow. You're, yeah, connected. It's beautiful. How about you, Scott? It definitely sent me into melancholy. Um, and I really started imagining my death. Hmm. Kind of, I kind of turned the voice over narrator into like great spirit talking to me. Right, right. That's kind of the way I played it. And, and I, and I've done a couple times I've done processes of imagining my death and always what comes up for me is incredible appreciation for what a phenomenally wonderful life I've had. Right. And I really am going to miss my body. I love it. <laughs> you know, my body's getting older and achy. And I just love this body so much. It's been so good to me for so long. And I'm not ready to let it go. <laughs> so honestly, that's what came up for me. It was beautiful. Yeah, it's funny. You know, the thing, though, that well, I've been speaking to audiences now around the world, around where I'll, I'll be that experience, Trish, where... People are kind of, you know, the way you are when you first meet them. There's just an energy, right? And then when I let the cat out of the bag in my keynotes and I play this track for a thousand doctors and nurses or whatever it is, and the energy in the room is so different afterwards. Just what it's an unmistakable what happens to humans when they all recognize, like almost suddenly nobody has clothes on. We're like, Wait, I mean, you mean like you know you're going to disappear one day too, and like oh you too oh, oh shit it's <laughs> and and that line that he said that I love so much he said, but you will always be here, and that to me of all the contributions of what graceful passages offers in toto, is this. It's not just the words; it's the music basically communicates and all is well, a transmission of all is well, that allows you to drop into the belief in the fact that we'll, that who we are never goes. Like who we are will be always here. And that to connect to that realization, it's a big deal. <laughs> to break that, that you know, Bhagavad Gita phrase that nobody ever thinks will happen to them. When you break that moment of delusion, it's almost like an emulsifier suddenly you realize, well, in this moment, like, wow, it really matters. <laughs> this moment really matters, you know? So that's the thing I love about it. It cracks people up into a, holy fuck, people are not, pardon me, I shouldn't encourage, that people are almost recognizing that they become more afraid of fully living than fully dying. And that's what lifts the curtain off of that. Wow. And that's like, how much can we really thrive? And I think it's on the other side of thriving, you know, you know, like I have a great love of those films because I worked on each of them, that the real thriving is putting skin in the game and knowing the way Don Juan recommended that death is with us at every step, every step, right? So that if we can do that and music can contribute to that, I'm good. I spent a lot of time, I've, I've spent a lot of time in death meditation. <laughs> Just being like, okay, strip the body away and imagine what that might be and the impact on lives. Like, sorry, mom and dad, I've thought about your death. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> all of you. Um, but you know, also, just I feel like we, all of us, need to know that demonstrating equanimity, equanimity compassion, acceptance, maturity to our peers, our loved ones, and our children and our grandchildren, as we're in this, I'm, I'm a lot older than you, but for me to cultivate the capacity to demonstrate dignity around the recognition of my impermanence is one of my job descriptions as a human being. <laughs> That's beautiful. That is beautiful. I want to I include some of our participants here. Great. So, um, I want to read something Nancy wrote after taking your experience. Um, Nancy uh, in our Facebook group writes, 
wow, I just had a great, sad and joyful cry. I re-experienced the deep love I felt for my family in my youth. Mm, wow, beautiful. And I'm gonna welcome a special guest who popped on into our Zoom room. And um, he's a, a friend of Trish and myself and uh, part of the Global Peace Tribe. He's helping us with our social media. Um, and he runs IANS in Hawaii. Sean Lethier, welcome aboard. Hi, thank you. Hello. I, uh, Hi, I'm Sean. so honored, Gary. I, 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 I was not supposed to be, well, I was supposed to be here and hear you, but <laughs> I didn't know that. <laughs> I thought I was going to be doing other things today. That is so amazing. I, I, um, it, it's hard to hold back tears because I was in the ICU three years ago and, 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 and I heard symphonies, not yours, but I heard symphonies and, and it's so amazing what you're doing because, uh, everything that you're saying is just really resonating with me and, um, the, the power of, of what you're doing, uh, which I don't even completely understand what you're doing. I just felt it. <laughs> Uh, is is really wonderful and and you know I myself I don't know if you've ever heard there's this uh, song by um, it's called Tell Your Heart to Beat Again if you've ever heard of his name his name is uh, uh, Dan Danny Goki and tell, so, tell your heart to what to beat again I'll stick it in the chat room. Tell your heart to beat again okay yeah so when I was in the ICU, it was really, really faint the very first time I heard this song. And literally, it's it was written by, a, I believe, a pastor, though it was written for somebody who had had heart transplant surgery. Wow. And and the heart didn't start. Wow. Um, or maybe it was the doctor anyway. But literally, they're literally telling this person, start your heart again. And so... I had that kind of experience in that I was done. My life was over. Mm. And, but, but for whatever reason, I, I got a, a well, I'm, I'm starting to understand the reason, but I, I, I got a second chance, but I had to have the message from this. And literally when you hear this song, you, you'll understand. So this song, it, it started getting louder and louder. But what happened is this song started following me through the process of the ICU, wow. later throughout the hospital, later through as I was going from Straub here in Honolulu to then what's called the Rehab of the Pacific because it was a, a several month ordeal. Um, it was as if this song was literally sent, which I know it was, and I know who it was sent by, reminding me yesterday's, I don't live there anymore, when you hear the song, you it's so what you're doing is so amazing because mm. people can are moved by that and yeah. and i know myself it 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 helped me a lot tremendously yeah yeah no well listen there's we're living in a quantification renaissance of music being a major major medicine of heart and soul like never before and that's why i started gravitating to other, what, what, what would it be like if we use music for the bonding process in before and after birth? And what would it be like if we use the bond, the heart opening process for mindfulness, rather than think that it's all about just watching thoughts? And what would yes. it be for heart centered leadership when we've dealt with more or less hierarchical power over, you know, so it's all about the reason I love uh, Teresa and all that. It's all about how would we act and what would we say and what we do if love did it? And we act, we disguise ourselves. So Scott, Sean, thank you for those very sweet and warm comments. And thank you for acknowledging the importance. And yeah, yeah, it's- uh, I would love if you want to present at, at any of our groups, by the way, your music, I, I, it would be such an honor. I don't know, you'll be sure to let me know more about what that would mean. Yes. I'd love to know more about it. Thank you, Sean, for joining us. Uh, it's beautiful to have your, to feel your love and to feel your experience and to kind of make it real. Um, so talking about grief for a moment. Yeah, yeah, very important right now, more than ever, actually, yeah. Yeah, and it's, 
one of the things that that comes to mind is Gay and Katie Hendricks, who've been on my show a few times, have a quote. They say the most horrible thing that people say in our culture is get over it. Get over it. And we are in a culture that doesn't support mourning, that doesn't support grieving, that supports move on, get on with it. And it's so important for us to take the time to grieve. And I, I, I'm just gonna share briefly, if, you know, most everybody by now knows I had a wife who was the love of my life who died almost 10 years ago now. It'll be 10 years in the end of November. And I miss her still terribly, but there also was nothing tragic about her death. It was actually, even though she was young, 52, she, there was an incredible liberation that we all experienced when we were in the room with her as she passed. And the reason I bring this up is because we can grieve and mourn without it being tragic, without it being an albatross around our neck, like there's something wrong with life. There's something wrong with this existence that someone died. And I, and I, I want to hear what Gary has to say about that. And, and Trish, if you want to weigh in, that balance of how we can grieve and mourn and still celebrate life, still celebrate the life of the person that's gone. Yeah. Um, well, and I think your music touches that. So, Gary, yeah, take it away. Well, you, I don't know if you know Arkan Lushwala. You know about the, the famous uh, indigenous leader who has consulted Bill and Lynn Twist on Pachamama events. And on oh, right. Yes, Saturday. I've seen you know, Sam and Pachamama. Right, right, right. Yeah. So Arkan is my one of my very important uh, teachers. And he really helped me correct me with something. Because until I worked with Arkan, I, I was really obsessed with the role that music can play in giving people permission to feel. And, you know, when I said that comment that people sometimes are more afraid of living fully than of dying, I think the larger epidemic at, at, at Haiyan is this fragmented attention and an unwillingness to be in a spacious relationship with the field that might include the what is of unresolved losses or recent losses or, in other words, the disease is a lack of presence with what is and a selective repression of the stuff that makes us, no, don't go there. And then by repressing it, what you, you know, resist persists, it feels like if I open this up, it'll never stop consuming me. I can never express enough tears because, you know, it gets to feel larger than life, right? So Archon said it was really important to feel, let it come like a conflagration through you feel it deeply, go to the ocean, express it, feel it, allow it, right? But don't allow the ensnared story attachment to, to like quicksand, pull you in to the constant retelling and the woe is me and all that, which is I'm, as a New York Jew, I'm very good at, my family is very good at that. So, so what I learned was that even more important, graceful as a tool, can accelerate or music like this uh, that can it can accelerate your comfort with being your own self-loving inner parent and holding you with what is right and then suddenly the full range of human experience becomes something we allow we move through it and then we express gratitude for the experience and we are able the goal is to move on more quickly and and what i want to say is that you know, Barbara Marks Hubbard used to call the noosphere, right? Remember that? I, I don't know if I got it right in terms of how she defined it, but I, the way I define noosphere is the sum total of all the shadows, subconscious wounds, traumas that humanity kind of stops it, it goes up to the noosphere. And right now it is more congested with unexpressed and unaddressed and unassimilated and unreleased great grief than ever since the history of humanity. Mm -hmm. And and when you add that to the equation, that 90% or more of all aberrated acts of violence and cruelty and trauma and abuse intentionally are from unexpressed and unaddressed grief, mm -hmm. we are actually living in the most, I don't wanna be fear inducing, but I just wanna be really clear about this. We're 
at the epicenter of a global grieving crisis that has to understand that grief is the boulder in the road through which we can only thrive as a species and as a as a, as a you know as it's as, as a steward of life right so that's why i just get very passionate about this because if we don't rewrite grief and understanding and releasing grief as the link to our living the life of our purpose and dreams we're gonna um screw ourselves yes I agree. And, we, and we are in the process through the denial structure of the perfect storm of denying illness death shadow trauma the trauma the abuse if we don't, so that's why one strategy, I don't have it all answered here, but my strategy that I've developed is what could we, what if would happen if we drenched ourselves in beauty, drenched ourselves in gratitude, drenched ourselves in the a belief in the miracle that life is, and learn how to be heart centered and mindful about it? Our, we would naturally call upon our innate skill to meet the moment right and that's i'd love i wouldn't wonder what you think about all that mm, i love what you're sharing here so um okay there, there's a an, an oh gosh i'm trying to wrap my, my brain up. i had something and i was like <laughs> <laughs> um, it happens to me i can't stand when that happens no, it, it's so there's a couple things that are i'll, I'll throw out the 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 thoughts and wrap it all into something <laughs> <laughs> rational go, go for it trish um so there's pieces around okay everyone has a, a different process of grief like and i and i think that in our society right now we're in the world global maybe universal i don't know i, I don't know how other beings out there um process their emotions and stuff right um I theorize it, it might be more effective than <laughs> what us humans are doing. Anyway, um, the for me, the process that I use is actually allowing what comes up and being in a safe container to actually emote, to feel, and to be in the container of my own experience. Um, so there's a piece of allowance. There's a piece of a, allowance of emotion. So we're just pinning that to the wall. There's also the understanding that music specifically on a tonal level impacts the body and the psyche in a very specific way. Um, so we can pin that to the wall. I, don't worry, I'm gonna wrap it all up, I swear. Okay. <laughs> um, and then there's a place of, of the shame of allowance of grief. Right. And, and that's something that Scott was talking about is that our society kind of just is like, we'll get over it. And, you know, grief comes in in different ways. Sometimes I'm laughing about something and sometimes I'm crying and sometimes I'm, you know, like it's it's the wave of human experience that we just have to allow. Right. So what I'm, I'm really loving <laughs> what, what we're talking about is the the intersection between processing emotion music and how that shifts our experience in the world so you know sean specifically was impacted by the orchestra that he heard right and then i think that you were impacted as well right and that's why we go to parties that's why we go see live music is because it takes us out of our chit chattery whatever egoic the pie is what i call it personality identity and ego it takes us out of that and gets us back into our resonant body right which is also allowing us back into our animal which is allowing us to process our feelings which is allowing us to get into the i'm gonna be bold and say the truth of it all the truth of being human is the feeling it the expressing it and that's why i think it's so important to add music there, that was a whole, <laughs> I pinned a lot of sticky notes to the wall. That was, <laughs> thanks for hearing that. Oh, well, you know, but the thing is, since time immemorial, the, the, the chant and the drum was always the link to the other world, but also the anchoring of intention, the carrier of intention. So this is something that our forebears, for as long as we've around, been around, have been using the sculpted vibrational tool of music and sound and chant to actually 
vibrate in a way that allows us to feel with be with what is right so mm. yeah i love i love all those pieces they're wonderful can i share with you what i think love is so love which was fed to me was very disney channel ish is this like longing heartfelt right off into the sunset sort of stuff and then i thought that love was codependency and this like severe attachment to something and that you bend and and contort to meet the people that you, you know, sacrifice, love of sacrifice. And by, you know, over the course of the last few years and taking Scott's, you know, mentorship group and relationship essentials has really helped me understand that love is the radical acceptance of what is. Yes. In the moment. It is Beautiful. In the moment. And so as I now look at love and loving someone, it, it's just expanding, right? So my capacity to be with someone's grief because I love them. Like I know what I know what anger feels like. Let's let's go, let's go break glass somewhere in a container space. Let's go cry and scream. And oh, do you want to pound on the bed right now and like scream into it? I can love you there. Let's do it. You know, and so like being with someone in their grief like having music to be in your grief. Like it's these, these places where we need to feel connection yeah. we, because that's where we, we find most pain. I think is the, yeah. the perceived disconnect, right, Scott? Yeah. So. I, you know, I'm loving this conversation and thank you, Sean, for being with us. And well, Sean has a whole playlist from the other side of his chat box. A couple of things, you know, when you were talking about how grief comes in waves. Uh, I was very close to my father. My father was my best friend. And uh, he died when I was very young. He died when I was 22. And I was blessed. I was the only one there with him as he died. And he came to me in dreams. So, you know, it was good. But as it played out, I never cried um, when he died. And um, three years went by. And one of the things that my dad and I shared was Dodger baseball. We would go to Dodger baseball games. And we went to, you know, we'd go to a lot of games, probably eight, 10 a year. And when he died, it just stopped going. Mm. Um, and uh, it had been three years since he died. And my best friend, Richard, uh, said, come on, man, I got tickets for the game. Let's go. So I said, sure. So we get in the car. And the moment we came up Chavez Ravine and I saw the stadium, I lost it. Yeah, of course you did. And I went into, I was literally, my friend had to pull over. I went to the back seat of the car, fetal position in convulsions, weeping. Wow. Three years later. Wow, yeah. We're talking, it stores in there, you know, and it wants to be released. Yeah. At, a, at its right moment, too. Yeah, it's amazing. Yeah. You know, and I, so thank you for bringing that up about it comes in waves. And you just never censor it, you know. When it comes, it comes. And let's never stuff our tears ever but well know? but you know I, i'm just interesting the reason one of the reasons we michael and i started going into the caregiver rejuvenation thing because we after we did graceful we started realizing we have to help the self-nurturing and the self-caring of healthcare providers who are so waxy build up with so much unexpressed grief it was like unbelievable and so we created the care for the journey program for them to kind of reconnect to why they wanted to get to healthcare in the first place which was the way that by going through that, then they became porous and reflective and receptive enough to feel the grief because graceful was, it was too provocative for them. Their grief was stuffed because they couldn't reconcile grief in their career as especially the kind of the leukemia children's unit. We were supposed to be with them for a weekend and it was really profound to see how, 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 how denied grief was with that group. But, one of the things that we then uncovered that I've learned, now learned in the last 13 years is because we live in a culture where 97% or more of the developed world hasn't bonded with their, with their mother or father, because the attachment bond has been cracked and wounded in the medical system as not even something worth preserving and valuing. And we now know that thing called the sacred hour where when the mother, when you're lucky enough to have a peaceful birth without complications, and then you have the child in a light, dimly lit room with the mother on the on the baby, there's these certain things that we know about the human capacities that get activated 
that if they don't happen, it's much harder. They, it's never too late to bond, but it's much harder, right? So that perfect storm of going through life, not feeling like I am loved, seen, acknowledged, or belong, even belong to somebody, creates a further a difficulty in cracking open to the grief that might be there, right? And that alone needs to be grieved, right? So it's it's a perfect storm. And I do think that music has a role, a, a, a role to be utilized much more intentionally than medication. <laughs> I really, really believe that we have ways of doing it that we've barely just scratched the surface of designing non-pharmacological beauty-infused aesthetic tools to wake people up to the reality of what is inside of them. It's beautiful that I know that I'm very optimistic about the future, actually. I really am. I want to read a couple of comments from our viewers and then we've got to wrap up. Um, Sean, who's right here with us, says that he didn't feel true love until he had his near-death experience, which I believe was three years ago. Wow. Um, uh, Susan you know, on Facebook writes, thank you everyone for getting people thinking about grief in a profoundly healthy way. Um, and Nancy writes, we are ready to burst out of grief and burst into joy. And that's yeah. you go back and forth between the two. Well, and also just be aware of the millions of people who haven't been able to say goodbye to their loved ones because of COVID. And I just want to hold us, hold that prayerful moment in honor of the millions of people who are looking for ways to make peace with that sentence, but you will always be here, right? And that's, if, if for those of you who are listening, the music only for Graceful Passages was designed to be in states of surrender so that you can actually have that kind of experience. So I just want to invite those who are listening to get the double, the both both CDs, which with words, without words, the one without words is the one that's kind of, it infuses the environment with the ability to surrender to the flow of life. And it's, it's a lovely tool to use in your toolbox. So thanks for letting me say that. Well, yeah, of course. And of course I want to take people to where they can learn. So, here is where people can stream your music on SoundCloud. Um, some so, of it, yes, yeah, some ex some excerpts for sure. Um, and I'll, I'll go to Wisdom of the World website next. Yeah, yeah, or, or yeah, the, certainly graceful. You can get it downloaded on Wisdom of the World, but you can also listen to it on Spotify. Um, the music only is called Unspeakable Grace. But there's on my uh, website. There's a lot of music that I've been doing around creating heart-centered mindfulness that will drop you into that state where the, you know, where the, your mitochondria align to the field kind of thing, the way Foster and Greg Braden would say. So the music, a lot of the music that's, that's on my website is around being in states of being connected to what is that will help you in that way. So that, that's at wisdomoftheworld.com. And hey man, I so appreciate. Oh, wow. Slow down, Gary. Let me oh, take sorry. sorry. <laughs> I love you, but slow down. We're wrapping up, but I want to take people to Wisdom of the World Wellness. because thank, thank you. This is Gary's website, and it's beautiful. So go to wisdomoftheworld.com. Wisdomoftheworld.com. <laughs> slow down. I love that. You slow down. This is the most important part. This is how people, you know, you've given them a homeopathic dose. Now people want more. Well, and all right. As long as we're shamelessly shamless, self-promoting, if you sign up for this uh, website, which is going to, I'm hoping to do a core, uh, probably a monthly, monthly newsletter. There are incredible gifts that go with an autoresponder series that literally with each letter you get your free MP3, these links. And so there's all kinds of gifts that come. And, uh, and also I will give you guys, if you want a, a special code to a gift box, you know, a gift, a kind of a bonus gift package, if you'd like. Yeah. I'd, be happy, I'd be happy to send that to you and people who are listening can experience some of the extra tracks as well. All right. So pop that in if you if you have it and you can put it in the chat box now you know, here in Zoom. That would be good for our Zoom friends. And then I'll copy it and I'll put it on our Facebook pages. And I'll go back. You know, I want to acknowledge that most of you who are watching this are going to be watching the video replay. So I will come back and I'll take a look. Um, one more while he's doing that, I just want to take a look again. Look at all the amazing people that Gary's worked with, almost all of whom I might say have been on Saturday Night Live. 
um, but just beautiful, beautiful souls. And these are the great leaders, the great wisdom teachers of our time that Gary has collaborated with and worked with in different ways. So, you know, Gary, thank you so much for who you are. Trish, I'm putting the spotlight on you for a moment. What are your final thoughts for tonight? Mm. My final thoughts are just really deep gratitude for Sean and, and Gary. Thank you for your sharing. And Gary, thank you for your work in the world. Um, I, I mean, I, we're all here doing our work in the world right now. <laughs> and I, I really appreciate you, you both being really honest. And Scott, always for being your, your just deepest, truest, raw, vulnerable self. Um, mm -hmm. I'm really touched by tonight's conversation and the importance it is to allow yourself and others to grieve and finding the strategies and the people and the love and you know the people who have support for you that that can really hold you there i get i feel like there's at least one person in this room well i mean i don't know where you are in the <laughs> on the screen i think it's right here um specifically that could really help you move through your grief thank you very you know, and it, what, one more thing is, don't forget that one of the great catalysts for grief resolution is movement and joy and celebration, right? So sometimes even faking it till you make it, like my inner, my work with the movement of the open floor and the five rhythms, it's essential to in, the somatizing inclusion and engagement of moving the energy and then it's a wonderful thing. So sometimes joy is what we deny often, right? So let's not I forget. I love that you said for open floor, open floor is one of my favorite practices. It's, it my, it's my, family, my family for 40, 30, 40 years. So yeah, I love them. Well, I'll go emote dance with you sometime. <laughs> Anytime. I love it. I love it. Sean, any last thoughts you'd like to share? I just want to thank you all. And Gary, um, you are doing, I just want you, you have to know you are so supportive. I'm sure you know, uh, you are so supportive. That's the only reason I came here today. Like literally, uh, I was guided and several people are, uh, you're doing God's work, really. Mm. You all are, you all are. But this music, um, what I sensed, because I, I think I heard it like right away. And I, I really tuned into the energy of it. It's, it's so powerful. And I can, I, can, I can only say that because of the power that music had for me. Great. So thank you, well, thank you all. <laughs> Thank you for your receptivity and taking it all in. That's gorgeous. Yes. And please come share with our IONS groups. I'll, I'll give you the information. Okay. I got your information. That's great. Cool. Gary, thank you for being with us. Um, thank you for your gifts to this world. Sean, great to see you, buddy. I'll talk to you soon. I have to say, I have to say, Scott, you are a amazing force, brother. I'm so proud of what you've done to step up to the plate for all of us. And I'm just really just kudos to the incredible service that you've entered into for all of us. I'm so, we're all the better for it. And I'm sorry I interrupted, but I just had to let you know, you're just doing some beautiful, beautiful work for all of us. Thank you. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Yes, and they are. And that's why I just gotta add that in real quick because God knows it, but I'll add it publicly. I don't volunteer all my time for just anybody. <laughs> I, these, the real deal. Well, thank, thank you. you. Thank you, Sean. Thank you. Well, that's a good segue into the final thing just to mention is tomorrow night on Saturday Night Alive for the Global Peace Tribe. We have an amazing show. Bruce Lipton, Sister Jenna, Oscar Miro Casada, Elizabeth Satoris, and many, many others. Wow. Um, and my co-host is Kristen Hoffman. Uh, Deborah is on vacation. And so we're going to have um, co-hosts most of the month or actually most of the summer. And Kristen Hoffman is my co-host tomorrow night. And she's invited all of her friends to be on the show. And the topic is great, The Great Awakening, Balancing Personal Freedom and Collective Vision. So please join us tomorrow night. Um, and come early in the Zoom Room show uh, from 5.30 to 6. It's going to be Bruce Lipton and Elizabeth Sartoris. And they have a very dynamic conversation that they're going to have. So come early, 5.30 Pacific time. Um, and we've got amazing shows coming up on July 10th. We've got another um, Mark Sims, Danny Sheehan, 
and a lot of people in that world. On uh, July 17th, an amazing show that Trish has put together um, all about racial and social justice. Um, July 24th, more wholehearted addiction and recovery work. And so it goes. So join us every week for Straight Talk um, and for my Sacred Sunday show. And of course, the Sunday Night Live, the Global Peace Tribe. Thank you, everybody, for watching. Share us. Take this if you like what we're doing. Share it with your friends. And maybe we could have sometime a Saturday Night Alive defying expectation by talking about this issue and the cycle of opening to a, our emotional range, right? Including grief and loss and joy and fullness. So think about it. it might be not something to do someday. Absolutely. Absolutely. I, yes. I'm a yes. I'm a okay, yes. Great. Great. All right. Thank you, everybody. God's Aloha. Blessing. Have a beautiful weekend. See you tomorrow night. Saturday. Thank you. Thank you, guys. Tomorrow.